Okay, we're going to give everyone just a few minutes to log on and get started. I'm just going to give it another minute or so to allow people time to log on. Okay, so I want to welcome everyone to our webinar tonight, Real Life Advice from New Dentists, presented by the American Student Dental Association. All attendees are muted so that we don't pick up any background noise. This webinar will be recorded and the recording will be posted on our website and will also be sent out to anybody who registered. So I'm Danielle Bauer and I am the facilitator for tonight's program. Um, I am the Director of Membership and Marketing at ASDA, so I'm one of the 14 full-time staff. Uh, for tonight's program, we have two panelists who are in their first five years of practice, uh, Dr. Glazier and Dr. Liu, and they will each share their experiences in selecting their specialty, finding their first job, how they deal with stresses of private practice, and what they didn't expect in the workforce. At the end, we will open up the webinar to questions. Um, so to, to, I'm sorry, to ask questions, you will see on the right side of your screen there is a control panel, and you can type your questions directly into this box. And at the end, we'll take the questions in the order that they were submitted. You could direct your questions to a particular panelist um, or just leave it general and one of them will answer. So we're going to start our program with Dr. Thomas Blazier. After obtaining his DDS degree from Virginia Commonwealth University School of Dentistry, he completed a residency in periodontics, dental implant surgery, and IV conscious sedation at VCU where he received a certificate in periodontics and dental implant surgery, as well as an MSD degree. He currently maintains a private practice limited to periodontal and dental implant surgery in Richmond. In his spare time, he's an avid drummer and enjoys spending time with his wife, Lauren, and their only child, a 90-pound golden doodle named River. All right, Dr. Glazier. Hey, thank you, uh, Daniel and Asa, for having me uh, this evening. Um, I guess uh, I will just kind of walk everybody through what my journey has been, um, and hopefully uh, you guys can learn from, you know, some of the experience that I've had um, and try to help you negotiate uh, what you may see over the next uh, five to ten years of your life. So originally I grew up in uh, rural Georgia, a little south of Atlanta, uh, went to the University of Georgia. Um, and started dental school in 2008, uh, did four years of dental school. And when I originally went into dental school, I had an idea that I wanted to do some aspect of surgery, um, really unaware of what the field of periodontics was at that time point. But as uh, I continued to grow in my experiences, I realized that that field was uh, really built for my way of thinking. Um, I'm very into tissue regeneration. I think it's just an absolute miracle that we're able to not only regrow uh, tissue in the oral cavity, 
uh, but you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, perform osseo integration. I mean, if people forget that 35 to 40 years ago, the concept of having an inert piece of metal heal to the human body uh, is just almost a miracle in its own right. And today, it's become such a commodity that we think it don't really think twice about it. But um, it's something that's really truly amazing. So uh, after finishing dental school, uh, I applied to seven different periodontal residencies and ended up getting into uh, my home university. Uh, my wife is from Richmond, so it was nice that we were able to stay here. Um, and I did three years of training um, in periodontal and dental implant surgery. Um, and you know, throughout this time period, one of the things that I thought was most important was creating relationships and looking at those people that were ahead of you in the journey, much like you all are doing tonight, and really finding people that you trust um, and who, uh, for me personally, that I almost uh, really cherish the way these people ran their practices, uh, treated others, um, you know, and, and really looked for a mentor. Uh, and I actually lucked out in that um, some uh, a gentleman that I met in dental school that has kind of uh, chaperoned me through this is now my partner in private practice. Uh, I work in a 50-year-old periodontal practice uh, here in Richmond, and you know I was I was just very lucky to be able to to you know spend time in this clinic. But it's also one of those things where I figured out what I wanted in life and you know where I wanted to work, and then did my best to learn and spend as much time with these people because. When you get out into private practice, you will quickly realize that it's a whole new ball game, you know, and you can do anything. I mean, you, you guys learn a lot in dental school, but it's really, really only the tip of the iceberg, not only in dentistry, but how to be a good business person and all the pitfalls and the things that you possibly can run into when you get into private practice. Um, and, it, and it can be very immense and overwhelming, but I think the only thing that at least gets me through this is having mentors to show me the right way. You know, you either learn from mentors or you learn from mistakes. And in dental school, mistakes are fine. That's how we learn. But when you get in private practice, it can mean your license. It can mean a lot of other things um, by making these mistakes, you know, and you want to try to avoid these as best as possible. Um, you know, so I think as you guys continue to progress throughout your career and uh, finishing up dental school, start to look for mentors and find a place that you want to live. I think that's also the other very most important thing. Um, you, you can carve out a role in the dental community in just about any city in, the, in this country, if not in the world, to figure out where you want to live. For me, that was near my wife's family. I always, always uh, kind of abide by a rule that a uh, happy wife, happy life. So, you know, having my wife near her family in the city that she grew up in uh, was very important to me and, and important uh, to us. And thus, I found mentors in this area that, you know, I personally feel practice at the highest level of dental care because that's what I'm after. I'm not after trying to you know, practice mid-level dentistry, you know, and I don't think anybody is, but, you know, it, it's, uh, it's very tough, you know, and, and work in a practice where, you know, almost everything I do is looked at under a microscope, um, and that can be very challenging some days, but it means I get better a lot quicker as a dentist, but, you know, also as a business owner. Um, for me, I work in a, uh, like I said, a, a practice devoted completely to periodontics and dental implant surgery. We're a fee-for-service clinic, i.e. we are non-participating with any dental insurance and we're 100% uh, referral-based. So we do very, very little marketing to the general public. And in a lot of larger markets, this has almost died out. But for us here in Richmond, it's quite successful and it's built mainly on establishing very, very strong personal relationships with the many members of the dental community 
Um, and that to me is something that I find at least most residents in the specialty fields come out really missing because in dental school and when I was in residency, the dental students looked up to us for information and, you know, we, we could teach them. But when you get into private practice, the general dentist is the gatekeeper and I live to serve all of them. I don't work for myself. I work for every general dentist, orthodontist, and endodontist in and around the city of Richmond to make their life easier, to make their dentistry more successful, more predictable, and to help them shoulder the burden of a lot of patients. So, you know, building relationships is almost my mantra. And I think it only, uh, it only helps you throughout your career. And it, it really is so important. Um, so, uh, I, I hate to keep continuing to talk, and I'll probably pass the phone back over to Danielle and hear what Dr. Liu has to say. Um, but if anybody has any questions specifically, I'd love to dive into any other facets of um, not only starting a private practice, but uh, um, also negotiating what I think most people have quite a mountain of debt today um, and some of the strategies involved in managing that. So, Danielle, if you want to take the the uh, torch back. All right, thank you. Um, let's see, bring it back up. Okay, great. Um, so now we'll move on to our next panelist, which is Dr. Darren Liu, um, a 2015 graduate from the University of Oklahoma College of Dentistry. Dr. Liu has been very involved in organized dentistry from an eager pre-dental member of ASDA to a passionate local district and national volunteer leader. He currently serves as a board member for the Oklahoma County Dental Society, the Academy of General Dentistry Oklahoma Chapter, the Oklahoma Dental Foundation, and is a guest writer for the ADA New Dentist Now blog. He was most recently inducted as a fellow of the American College of Dentists, and in his spare time, Dr. Liu is an avid traveler self-proclaimed foodie and social media junkie. He lives to travel, travels to eat, and shares foodie pictures on your news feed. All right, Dr. Liu, so I will pull up your presentation for you. Um, you can give me just a quick second. ready to go. Perfect. Can you all, can you hear me? Yep. Excellent. All right. Um, thank you all so much for, for uh, joining on this webinar. It's an awesome resource. I'm really, really glad that ASDA does this for you all. Um, I'll just flip to the next slide. Um, you kind of heard a little bit about me. I'm a 2015 grad from the OU College of Dentistry. I've lived in Oklahoma for almost 20 years now. And so I've spent a lot of time um, I guess really falling in love with dentistry. I kind of got involved in dentistry a little later on in my career. I got my bachelor's in 2006 and um, got accepted to dental school in 2011, then graduated 2015. And flash forward two and a, almost two and a half years later, here we are. Um, and so during my time in dental school, I was act active with the uh, American Student Dental Association. I really, really enjoyed that experience. Um, and during my senior year, I um, started talking to a lot of different started evaluating all my options. And I ended up talking to a recruiter from Heartland Dental, which is a dental service organization or a DSO. Corporate dentistry is kind of one of the terms thrown out there, but DSO is how I'm going to kind of refer to it for the rest of this uh, webinar. And um, I talked to a lot of people who had experiences within Heartland across the nation, but also within Oklahoma, and I heard very, very positive things. Uh, a lot of the, you know, like kind of Dr. Glazier mentioned, a lot of the dentists uh, that you kind of establish relationships with. I, I think that starts at a very, very early age. And so for me, as a senior student, I was talking to people who had, you know, a few years experience with Harlan, and um, these are people I trusted. I, I highly valued their ethics, their morals. I thought they were outstanding practitioners, and um, they had positive experiences. And so at that point, I kind of felt comfortable. And um, from there, I did a little bit more research. I kind of asked and picked the recruiter's brain on what offices were available because I really wanted to do my homework. I didn't want to just be kind of placed into a random office. I wanted to know where exactly I was going. Um, and from there, um, I learned that there was a really strong dentist uh, who would be a 
great mentor for me in Shawnee, Oklahoma. I live in Edmond, which is just north of Oklahoma City, and Shawnee is about a 50-minute commute each way. So for the past almost two and a half years, I've been driving um, two hours almost every single day um, to, to be at this practice, and it's been a fantastic experience um, so far. Um, and so kind of to flip to the next slide, um, this will kind of show you all a picture of my team. Um, oh, next slide after that. There we are. So that's, uh, that's us in Shawnee. Um, Dr. Simpson is the, the mentor I kind of refer to. He graduated a few years before me, did a year at AGD. Um, fantastic person to partner with. And, you know, the, the bottom left slide, that's the day of our, like, dress up. I think maybe it was Halloween, maybe it was Nerd Day. Um, Dr. Simpson's not very... Um, I guess colorful with his costume, so he pretty much rolled up his socks and slicked back his hair, and he was a nerd that way. But anyways, um, that's our practice. And so one of the first things that I want to tell you about the the real world about dentistry is that um, each practice has its own culture. Now, whether it's private practice, whether it's an FQHC community health center, uh, an associateship opportunity, uh, a DSO opportunity, every single practice has its own culture, and it's by you know what I mean by that is that you know how it's led by the doctor, what the team is like, how they respond to one another, how they feed off each other, and so if you kind of think of it like the dating game, if you will, um, you know my experience was that I was kind of set up with a matchmaker. I had someone actively seek me out and say, "Hey, here's some opportunities," um, and then we kind of got it hooked up from there. Right now, I'm actually transitioning from my practice, and so I'm looking to uh, various associateship opportunities and private practice opportunities. And now I'm kind of like back in the dating game. I'm back in that dating pool, and instead of talking to a lot of different recruiters, I'm actually venturing out there and putting myself out there and starting to form those dating relationships, if you will. And, you know, it, it's kind of intimidating when you're a dental student or you're kind of like on the cusp of making that decision of what is that going to be like, what questions do I need to ask, and ASDA has a ton of resources for you all. ADA has a ton of resources. There's a lot of resources out there. And my point almost being is that there are almost too many resources. And it, it can be super overwhelming. Now, nowadays, I think our culture is very, very interesting. I think a lot of us try to find, like, the best of the best of the best. You know, like, if I want to buy, like, you know, um, something random on the Internet, like, I'm going to go on Amazon.com and check out all the reviews. I'm going to go on Wirecutter.com and read all the reviews. I'm going to watch, like, five different YouTube videos of different reviews, and we're going to do a lot of research. But ultimately, what you're going to find out is that no matter what practice setting you're in, like, you will, you're going to do well with the right mindset and the right mentality. And I know that sounds, like, really, really cheesy and kind of, like, touchy-feely, but that's what it really kind of boils down to. So I'll kind of flip to the next slide right there. Uh, one of the questions that were asked was kind of like, how do you deal with the stresses of practice? Um, and that partnership right there is, is how I do it every single day for the past two and a half years. Um, when I talked about earlier how Dr. Simpson is a fantastic mentor, colleague, as well as just friend, is that some like, the best times, it's not when he's like come over to kind of like take a look at a tooth with me or walk me through a treatment plan or kind of, you know, walk me through what he would do in a situation. Those have been absolutely great. But some of the best moments really have been the times that we're in the office like 30 minutes after uh, we've seen the last patient and we are just talking about dentistry. We're just talking about life and we're just connecting. And it, it might be, it, it could have been like after a day that I struggled, you know, like you're going to struggle a lot in the real world. But on a day when you struggle and you, you don't have that outlet of like, oh my gosh, like there's, there, there's so much stress to be perfect with everything that we do. Because, you know, with dentistry, you're kind of working at a very micro level um, and you're dealing with, you know, increments of like millimeters and it just gets really highly, highly technical. So, you know, you've experienced this in dental school. You're already placing a lot of stress on yourselves as you go throughout the curriculum. You know, they put you in sim lab and you are sitting there waiting like, oh my gosh, like this person just finished like 10 minutes before me and I just broke my model so I got to start all over again. Um, you know, it, it's that kind of mentality that builds up. And, and so the times when we get to just kind of sit and talk about this is what I feel right now, like this sucks, like I wish I could have done this better or maybe I could have done it this way. And just his reassurance that, hey, I've been there. I've, I know exactly what you're feeling. And, you know, 
this is how we can kind of move on from there. I think those have been some of the most rewarding and powerful moments. And it definitely alludes to what Dr. Glazier kind of mentioned that ultimately it's going to be about the kind of relationships that you're, that you're able to kind of craft and create. And so between this partnership um, with two doctors in the office, um, leadership kind of branches out from there. And so in the real world, what you're going to find, and maybe you've heard of this before, but the clinical dentistry is definitely one component, but also the team leadership, the team management, that becomes another, another critical moment that you really don't have that much training for while you're in school. You know, in dental school, you're learning technical, technical, technical. You're learning all the fancy terminologies. You're learning all these concepts. But do you really have the opportunity to learn how to talk to people? Do you learn how to manage others, lead others, and help them see your vision. And sometimes you do if you get super involved with extracurriculars and you kind of balance yourself out that way, but not a lot of people do. And so from that type of partnership that we're able to, to form, um, we're able to kind of try our best. And it doesn't happen all the time, but that's what we constantly try to do is we try to be on the same page. We don't try to create a culture of like, okay, go ask mommy or go ask daddy. It's that, okay, mommy's gonna say, I'm on the same page as daddy, whatever, that's a, that's a weird analogy. But anyways, what I'm saying is that we're, we try to be on the same team. And so when we have issues with our assistants or our dental hygienists or our business team members, um, we're able to kind of stay in sync, stay in unison. And that's one of the biggest ways how we uh, kind of deal with the stresses of, uh, of practice. And so on the next slide, is it's just a kind of a collection Oh. <laughs> That's a terrible joke. On this slide, it's a kind of collection of like some of my favorite memories in dental school. Um, from dental mission trips to volunteering at Mission of Mercies to planning events with ASDA and like just being with my family and friends. Um, dental school is going to fly by super, super, super fast. And you kind of already noticed like maybe some of you are senior students and you're going to think back like, what happened to like the past three years? I still remember, you know, like my brand fresh new scrubs sitting in pre sim lab and looking at all like the shiny hand pieces and now you're kind of like in the thick of it. And so one of the other takeaways that I can offer you is it's really your mentality that's going to make one of the biggest, biggest game changers in your career. Um, right now, at, in a DSO setting, one of the biggest challenges is that you don't have that ownership, so to speak. Um, however, when you're in dental school, it's kind of like the same, same feeling almost. And if you think about it, some of the most successful dental students, the ones with that ownership mentality, the ones that are going to be proactive, they're going to seek out their own patients. If a patient cancels on them, they know exactly who they're going to call to fill that slot. They know where they're going to be, where they're going to be the following day, the next week. They're kind of on it, you know. And the same thing applies in practice. Because I can think about and reflect upon the past two and a half years of my life, and it's gone by like that in a heartbeat. And I've, I've seen a lot of patients. I've done a lot of great things. But the day-to-day -day grind, it's, the, it's almost the exact same as in dental school in that you have to kind of work at it with a sense of intentionality. And you have to know what you're doing every single day with a sense of purpose. Otherwise, time is going to kind of slip by. And before you know it, two and a half years later, you're going to kind of think, well, what, what have I done over the past few years, you know? And I think just like dental school, practice is the exact same thing. So having that ownership mentality will give you a huge, huge edge on, uh, on being successful in your practices. Now, the next slide um, is a collection of pictures of a study club that I'm involved with. Um, I love continuing education, CE. I'm, I'm a huge hard time CE junkie. Um, and there are plenty of CE opportunities once you graduate. Um, I think one of the things is that people tend to gravitate towards like the, the bigger, bigger, more attractive procedures like implant placement. Um, I think that's great. And if that fits your learning style and your personality, more power to you. There are plenty of courses out there that are willing to take your money. Um, what I've definitely found, especially for like the first year or so, is just get really, really good at the basics. And that's probably not the advice a lot of people want to hear. It's not the advice that I wanted to hear when I first got out. I wanted to hear like all the big, awesome procedures. But if you get really good and consistent at the bread and butter dentistry, you'll always have that as your backbone. Um, I remember thinking when I was evaluating my options, um, you know, one of my concerns about doing community health is that, oh, do you not 
cut crowns? Do you not uh, do a lot of endo? What is that like? I don't. I just don't want to be doing fillings all the time, like especially like class two, like quad quadrants of class two fillings. But then one dentist who actually went through that career path for a while explained to me and shared with me this great insight that if you can cut a class two prep, you can cut a crown prep. And so really like building those efficiencies is going to be a huge game changer uh, for your practices. And those of you all who are like, oh my gosh, like I don't know how long things are taking in dental school. I'm, I'm super slow. It's going to take forever. Believe me, I, I don't have the luxury of three hour appointments for my patients and they probably wouldn't even want that. Um, having an assistant cuts like your time in half. Having a good assistant is an awesome plus and you'll get to experience that very, very soon in a few years. Um, so anyways, continuing education, learn the basic, learn the bread and butter of dentistry, uh, and then you can kind of move on from there. And the thing about CE is that you can attend as much CE as you want. Like I've racked up, I think on my like, uh, towards, I'm working towards my fellowship in the Academy of General Dentistry. I have like almost 408, almost 500 hours, everything I need to get that fellowship without taking that exam. Um, but actually implementing CE, that is one of the biggest struggles because it's not just you, okay? First, number one, you got to keep yourself accountable with actually learning the CE and going, okay, what are the pearls that I've learned in this class? How am I going to implement that? But also having your team implement that because I can't tell you how many times I've talked to other dental assistants, hygienists, other team members who say, okay, you know, Dr. So-and-so is going to come back from this class all jazzed up about dentistry and he wants to invest in all this technology. And then two weeks later, we go back to the same exact thing. I think that's kind of like one of the saddest and one of the most frustrating things that it's, it's just kind of like a waste in a way. And so the, the, the moral of that story is consistency is going to be one of your best friends as you practice. And that's ex something that you can definitely excel at while you're in school right now. Um, the next slide right there, um, that's just a picture of a, a community group that I was involved with called LOYAL, st stood for uh, Leading Oklahoma's Young Adult Leaders. Um, and that's just my way of saying dentistry is absolutely awesome. Uh, once you graduate, you're going to have so many opportunities. You know, there's life beyond dental school, that's for sure. And whether that means, you know, furthering your career, spending more time with your family, or just being involved with the community. Like Dr. Glazer said, I, I absolutely loved it. Um, relationships. That, that's what it's absolutely all about. Um, the next slide is kind of another update of the different things I've been able to do. Um, most recently I led a, a group of students on a mission trip uh, to Jamaica. Um, the bottom left picture right there is a group of my classmates actually at a recent wedding this past summer. Um, and I think that kind of gets back to one of like the things I actually miss about dental school uh, that you'll come to find is it's really the camaraderie. It's like one of the best, the absolutely the best things. Like that feeling of sitting um, in lecture going, I don't know what this person's talking about. Do you? No, I don't. Or like after the, the big exam and going, what'd you get on this? Like, or, oh my gosh, that was a terrible test. Whatever it is, like, or even sim lab, you know, sh staying up late, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at lab at night and working through the grind of, you know, pouring up models, whatever it is, like those relationships almost disappear when you graduate. And that's not supposed to be a depressing thing, but dentistry in a way can be a very, very isolating profession because it's kind of like you're working in your own little island. Some of you lucky ones will get to work with, you know, other practitioners under the same roof. But at that point, it's up to you to have that consistency and intentionality of maintaining relationships, building upon relationships and branching out, whether it's with classmates, whether it's branching out with specialists like Dr. Glazier, whatever that case may be, all that becomes a lot more intentional. Um, and of course, I say the best for last, that was a little neat community event. Uh, it's called Heels On For Her uh, that I participated in as, a, as the local dentist. And we wore heels and got to run an obstacle course. And I was absolutely the only one who, after the hopscotch, just face planted and totally bit it. But it was a cool event. We got to raise the money and raise awareness for um, uh, domestic abuse. So the next picture right there, um, on the next slide, that's, um, that's my dental team right there. 
Uh, one of my dental goals was to take bring my dental team to Mission of Mercy, um, and so that's that picture on the left hand side. And the right side is when we were at a community event. So a um, lot of cool things out in the store for you all. You're all going to take different paths, different learning uh, opportunities, and there, there's no wrong way. Uh, kind of like Dr. Glazer mentioned, you know, you're going to have your degree, you're going to have your your um, degree in dentistry, your DDS or DMD, and that's yours to cherish and protect, and do absolutely what's best for your patients. Um, if I can leave you with any last pieces of advice, um, what you can do now in dental school, track your accomplishments, meaning um, keep track of like how many procedures you're doing, um, and then start kind of timing yourself in, in, in a way. Um, set a little timer on your smartphone, stopwatch, whatever that may look like, and recognize how long it takes you to kind of go through whatever procedures, whether it's walking a patient through, um, you know, a comprehensive exam, or whether it's for an your anesthesia or your, your first filling, whatever that may be, track it. Because without metrics, without a way to actually tangibly evaluate how you're performing, you're just going to be kind of doing whatever. Um, and that's something that you can kind of get into the habit right now when you're in school. Um, another kind of silly, touchy-feely thing, but really, close this webinar down after we're done. Write down what kind of dentist you want to be. Write down your vision. Um, and that kind of feeds back into what I talked about earlier about accountability and uh, consistency and an intentionality. Because without that, you're just kind of going to be doing whatever and kind of flown out there. And you'll get results, but it's up to you if those are the results that you want. Um, things that also you could work on now are patient communication. One of the funniest things about dental school is that you learn, you spend so much time and effort to learn the technical. And so then you're throwing all this technical jargon at your patient when you're kind of trying to talk them through a treatment plan. But when you learn the technical, when you graduate, you have to unlearn that technical and learn how to explain it in layman's terms to, to your patients because they're not going to understand what endodontic therapy means. They might have heard of root canal, but that root canal word, that, that phrase right there, in, in, um, gives them fear and anxiety about it. So you have to find a way of, you know, find the right verbiage and the way to, to carefully explain things. Because, you know, when patients attend dental school, sometimes it's because of limited finances, um, whereas in the real world, um, they are going to have a lot more, you know, maybe cash flow and way like different dental insurances and way to procure that dentistry, but they're not also going to be able to spend multiple three hour appointments with you. Um, and they're going to want to trust you and trust what you're communicating with them. Um, so learn your learning style, know what kind of learner you want to be, whether you're going to want to spend a year in residency or if you want to kind of go straight out into the real world. Um, so anyways, um, I have two more slides on here. This last, uh, the second to last slide, this is just a thank you. Uh, I'm a huge fan of this organization. Thank you all for being members of this organization uh, and taking time out of your schedule to join us on this, this webinar. Um, and hopefully you find this very beneficial as a, as a good member benefit. And my last slide right there, you can hold up for just a little bit. Um, I guess I had some contact information, but if nothing else, you can get my contact information at the end of this webinar. So anyways, that is that. And Danielle, I'll toss it back to you. All right. Thank you. A uh, lot of good advice and tips. Um, all right. I am going to, sorry, take us back to the other presentation for a moment. Um, here we go. Okay, so before we get into uh, questions, um, Dr. Liu had mentioned that there are many resources out there from both ASDA and, as he mentioned, ADA. Um, I wanted to share with you a sort of um, new area of resources for ASDA, which is our Career Compass. And we launched this in April. And the, the goal of this is to help, the, help students prepare for graduation and transition to that first step in their career. So um, the areas that are listed there is kind of how the site's broken down. So there's some resources for graduation and career options. So things on licensure and the various options you have, whether you want to go um, into a specialty or general or military or whatever those options may be. There's uh, resources for different post-grad programs and what to consider. Um, the option of if you just want to go and get a job, what options are there. 
Um, you know, if you're going to go to an associateship, what you need to look for in a contract, and then some financial and practice management. So the website at the bottom will take you directly to that site. Um, we're going to be continuing to offer uh, more and more resources through Career Compass. Um, webinars like this, uh, information online, information in Contour, um, so you can watch for that Career Compass uh, brand. Okay, so at this time, this is the email of our panelists, but I do want to open this up for questions, and I saw that there are some. Um, so let me read our first question. Um, oops, sorry, give me one second to... Okay, so the first question um, was, is it good to start as a solo dentist or better with a mentor dentist? I think this might have been when you were speaking, Dr. Glazier. Um, yeah, that's, uh, so again, I get back to my statement, you either learn by mistakes or learn by mentors. In today's world, it, I, at least in the field of periodontics, I mean, I can't speak for general dentistry, but I feel that being a general dentist is even more complex than being a specialist uh, in today's world. And starting off as a solo practitioner is incredibly difficult. I mean, it just, it, it blows my mind people even try it. And I'll be honest with you, I have seen people go bankrupt and lose their practices early on uh, that, just don't, don't understand the market and you go into an area and, you know, again, you are used to having three hour long appointments to cut a couple class twos. You're never going to survive this way. And, you know, to me, having a mentor that allows you to go maybe a little bit outside of your comfort zone or to at least bounce ideas off of before you make those mistakes is incredibly invaluable. Um, you know, I just, again, I, I, cannot speak enough to finding somebody to help guide you through these first couple of years. You know, and if you're going to start your own shop, I would have somebody that maybe if they're not in your practice that you can at least call up and ask questions. Because when you get out, you're going to have a zillion and a half questions. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, um, Dr. Lou, but I mean, every single day during these first couple of years, it's like, okay, is should I put that in my notes? Should I not put that in my notes? Um, I mean, just I'm just trying to think of all the things. Is all right, can you explain all the ins and outs of OSHA regulation in your office? You know, uh, what happens if you have an emergency? You know, I mean, there's just so much stuff uh, that is just never covered in dental school. Um, so I, I I think to come out and think you have it all uh, figured out enough to start your own business is a bit naive. And um, it's very, very expensive to do in the startup uh, your own practice, too. I mean, this is additional debt you're going to have to shoulder yourself. Okay, great. Um, I think this one is probably directed towards you, Dr. Liu. I was wondering why you chose to go into a corporate dental practice out of dental school. Great question. Um, I think it's funny, like in dental school, you kind of hear a lot of negative things about it, but I always had the personality that I kind of wanted to experience it for myself. Um, and, you know, ultimately, whether you're in a corporate practice, a DSO, or a private practice, you know, you work as the doctor. Like, you, you, you are the practitioner. You're the one with that license. So, you know, every single decision that when I took a bird to a tooth um, was my decision, my decision alone. Now, you know, I, I think, and I've heard absolute horror stories about, you know, DSOs, but I've also heard really bad stories about private practices. So one of the th first things I talked about was how every practice in itself has its kind of like own culture, if you will. So when you're going through that process of interviewing and kind of dating practices, spend time with them, ask them those questions, ask them what they would do with this scenario. Are they going to 
maybe are they willing to go into uh, work on the weekend if they have an emergency patient? Like, do they, you know, contact their patients as follow up uh, after treatment? Will they do this or that? Like things like that, and really just kind of get a feel for how they practice and what their philosophy is. Um, you know, I, I spent the past two and a half years with in a DSO setting. I have absolutely no regrets, and uh, you know, every patient I treated, I treated as my own if it was my practice or somebody else's practice. Um, I think, you know, DSOs kind of get like a really bad reputation these days, um, but kind of like I said earlier, I'm going to start repeating, but um, every place has its own culture, and so that's kind of up to you to ex have that experience. Um, so another question to you is why did you choose not to do like a GPR or an AGD? Why did you decide to go straight into practice? Great question as well. Um, so I actually applied to an AGD. Um, I did not get in, and that's how I ended up where I did. Um, I have a lot of um, you know senior dental students ask me about that journey and that experience. Um, my recommendation: always apply. Like always have your options. Um, and it kind of goes back to how I ended my presentation on understanding your learning style, because some people, if you're in a senior student and you're like just tired of the academic environment that might not be the best fit for you. But one of the best things I always heard was that, um, you know, an AGD or a GPR is like the best year of hands-on CE that you could ever receive. Um, so not all residency programs are alike. Um, there's some that are more, you know, have a higher emphasis on surgical. There's more that have like that private practice model. So they're gonna kind of teach you more of the business as well. So definitely do your research. If I had to do it over again, um, I'd probably go the exact same route just because I've learned so much over the past two years. Um, I, I've made a decent income as well. And I've been able to funnel that income back into continuing education. Now, does that absolutely top what a residency could offer? Maybe, maybe not, but you know, I know you all are trying to make like that absolutely perfect decision right now, right this moment. So if you kind of feel that hesitation and you're, you're kind of interested in residencies, apply and see what else is out there. And then at that point, weigh your options. Because I can guarantee you, like Dr. Glazer mentioned, if you find a good mentor, you can learn a ton. So that's my thought on that. I think this question maybe you could both answer. Um... They're asking how long do you think it will how long do you think it'll take to pay off your loans? <laughs> Not as quickly as you'd when like me. Probably when I'm dead. <laughs> no, I mean so that's a good question. I right, and what's very interesting is that I think that um and depending on what route you take. Um, all right, so here's here's how this works, especially if you're going towards an owner route of a practice. You're going to have your student loan debt, and then in order to get a loan to either buy into a practice, to buy a practice, to buy somebody out, the bank is going to basically, well, the other part of this is, you know, I didn't want to rent a home for a tremendous amount of time. So then you start having to realize that you've got to buy a home typically before you can buy a practice. It doesn't always work out like that, but if you do it the other way where you go to get a loan for a business, then the bank is usually going to require at least several years of balance sheets to see that you're going in the right direction before you're ever going to get any more money to purchase a home. So which you think you have a lot of debt in student loans is only going to go up as you get into private practice. And unfortunately, I've not really seen any other way to do this. Um, but the interesting thing is, is as you, you the whole point of, of, at least in the path that I've taken, the whole point in ownership is to increase your cash flow. So as you start to get paid more based off of your equity, that you own, you can start then dedicating more and more of that towards your student loans. But I would not think, you know, at least for me personally, it's going to take probably until I'm 40 before I start really turning a crazy good profit. However, the other part of that is that your quality of life throughout this time period is not terrible. I mean, you're going to find out that you can get some really nice financing options for homes when you get out and practice. 
a lot of banks that offer physician and doctor loan packages. You know, and so I may be a lot in debt, but I still enjoy a pretty nice quality of life throughout all of this. And it's just a matter of time. I mean, this is just part of your journey and you've got to learn to enjoy the journey. You know, I don't think anybody got into this to get rich. And if you did, you know, I, I'm sorry, but, you know, I don't want to burst your bubble. I mean, you're going to live nicely, but it's going to take time to get to to a point where you're really, you know, building up a large sum of, of, of money, you know. So it's going to take some time. Yeah, I'll, I'll just echo those comments for sure. Um, I think the only thing I would add is that if you're asking that question, then you're miles ahead of everybody else. Because I know plenty of people who are in my class and plenty of dental students who don't even think about that. and they keep withdrawing outrageous sums of money um, and using loan money for whatever. Now, I'm not saying don't travel, don't you know, live while you're in dental school because you have to have those ways to kind of balance out all that stress, uh, whether that's to travel or whatever that is. But at the same time, like recognize that as soon as you graduate, that money becomes real very, very fast. And I graduated with about 195. Um, I, I went to my in-state school, and I checked the other day, and I've probably paid off about 30000 so far, paying about 2000 a month. Um, I refinanced my loans uh, earlier this year with DRB. through. Uh, that's kind of like the, the partnership between DRB or Laurel Road and the ADA. Uh, and so I was able to get mine down to like four point. 3% I think interest which was way better than what it used to be because that was crazy uh, but anyways yeah um, it, it'll take me a while but that's that's what we all got into um, the next question is should I look for practices that let me do root canals and surgical extractions or is it fine to just do fillings and common procedures it's whatever you want to do what what makes you happy? No, absolutely. Like that's the beauty of general dentistry, and I guess one of the big reasons why I never went into a specialty is that like I randomly like just loved it all. Uh, and maybe there are a few things like removable that I didn't like as much, but I, I as a general dentist, I love the versatility of what I can do, and every each and every single day is radically different from the last. Uh, and so, you know, I'll I'll share a little bit about my journey with. Endo. When I first started, I was like, "Yeah, molar endo. Like, I, I totally want to get better at like wave one system. I'm all about that. I had great mentors. Had a few cases where it didn't go exactly how I would have loved, and so then I kind of teetered back from there. And most recently, you know, after a little bit more training, um, I feel way more comfortable with endo, and so I'm kind of building back up. So, you know, it just depends on what you enjoy doing, what you love doing. If you want to get into wisdom teeth, if you want to get into you know surgical extractions. Go for it. Just find good mentors. Um, I wouldn't trust, you know, just a CE course. Um, kind of like Dr. Glazer talked about. Find people that can kind of walk you through things and be there to support you, um, especially as you kind of branch out of your comfort zone. Great. Um, next question is: Did you ever? I, I think this might be for Dr. Glazer um, in your practice, but. Did you ever consider working with students who graduated with you, and have you seen other students do this? Yeah, I mean, this is how I survive right now, um, is, you know, I went to dental school and residency all at the same school. So I kind and kind of knew throughout this whole journey that I was going to probably stay in the same city. So, so if you've never been to Richmond, Virginia, this is where the Virginia Commonwealth University School of Dentistry is. So... I've been working on building relationships since I knew I was getting, well, since I was in dental school, but then when I knew I got into perio, you know, all I did was, you know, try to foster the learning and build these relationships with then dental students who are now my solid referral base. And it makes, it makes my practice so gratifying that we all get to learn together. We've known each other for years. You know, it almost feels like, this little tight club of people in town. Um, and without them, I would literally see, I don't know, a scaling appointment at eight in the morning and one at 4.30. Like I almost kind of, when I first started out, it was so slow, I wanted to get in the street and just, I don't know, have my assistants 
punch people in the back alleys to give me give me implants to put in. You know, I mean, it's a joke, but you know, it it can be it's quite slow from a specialist perspective that builds that building a practice is referral based. Um, you know, and that it you're so yes. Uh, you know, I love all of these former students, whether they be um, people that were in my dental school class or younger or a couple years older, you know, it's it's been a fantastic experience. Great. Um, so the only other um, thing we had somebody sharing a suggestion, not a question. They said that there is a podcast called Shared Practices which interviews multiple dentists and experts and answers a lot of questions similar to this. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of shared practices, but I guess for any of the participants, it might be something to check out as well. All right, well, it doesn't look like we have any more questions, so um, I would really like to thank both of our panelists, Dr. Glazier and Dr. Liu. Um, you guys were really helpful, shared a lot of good information, good advice. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is recorded, so we will post this on our website and we'll send out a link to anybody who registered uh, once the recording is posted. So I would really like to thank any, everyone for participating in tonight's program. We'll also send out a brief survey um, that we would really appreciate your input that helps us determine what topics and um, you know, what types of resources that we offer in the future. So thank you so much. Everyone have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.